Hey there, Hang Up listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. AI comes at you fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Whether you're looking to automate tasks or embed AI in your business processes, SAP can help. To learn more, head to sap.com slash AI. And stick around for expert advice on how to embrace AI with confidence. Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase, every day. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City Branch. Subject to credit approval. Terms apply. This podcast contains explicit language. If you want to know how explicit, keep listening. Hi, I'm Josh Levine, and this is Hang Up and Listen for the week of March 25th, 2024. On this week's show, we'll talk about whether NCAA basketball has passed Kentucky coach John Calipari by, and what a three-point shooting transfer from Hillsdale College says about the state of college sports. Plus, we'll try not to get sued for defamation by LSU coach Kim Mulkey, and we'll try to figure out what's going on with Ellie Dodger star Shohei Otani, has now former interpreter, and millions of Otani's dollars that were allegedly used to pay off the interpreter's gambling debts. I am in Washington, D.C. I'm the author of the book The Queen and the host of an upcoming slow burn season on the rise of Fox News and how the left tried to fight back. Also, in D.C. is Stefan Fatsis. He's not on the show this week. I just wanted to assure you that he does still live in D.C. Still in Palo Alto, slate writer and podcaster Joel Anderson. Joel, the best game of the weekend was right down the street, Stanford women over Iowa State and OT. Did you run over to bow down to Kiki Iriafin? Well, nobody cares about my own personal travails, but I was too sick to do anything uh, up until maybe Saturday afternoon. So unfortunately, I missed Cameron Brink and the, the ladies uh, bringing it home. But, you know, I sent a shout out from, I, I can I can kind of wave to the Ariaga <laughs> Center from here. So we made my presence known one way or another. I'm sure they appreciated it. Yeah. Also with us this week is our Slate colleague, Ben Mathis Lilly. He's the author of The Hot Seat, A Year of Outrage, Pride, and Occasional Games of College Football. Ben, basketball is the one where Michigan loses. Not anymore. Not now that we've hired red-hot coaching candidate Dusty May right out of the clutches of uh, the Louisville Cardinals. Congratulations. Louisville definitely needs a coach. So I kind of feel bad for them. But, you Mm. know, it's a revenge for that NCAA title game, right? Exactly. Does Louisville need a coach more than Michigan? I mean, I feel like they, they both need he won pretty badly at this point. Well, Louisville just doesn't have that uh, recent football success to fall back on, I think. You know, and they've uh, they've become estranged from Papa John. I don't know how many people know that. So that's like a, a real major, formerly uh, important yeah. cog in their uh, their donor and hype machine. Uh, so yeah, they're they're on hard times a little bit down there. So so it's not just like an NCAA title game rivalry. It's also a Papa John's versus Domino's <laughs> rivalry. That's right. And don't forget Little Caesars. Uh, Little Caesars heir, Denise Illich, uh, University of Michigan regent. We want to thank our Slate Plus members for making this show possible. And we want to alert you that we're going to be doing something different with our bonus segments starting this week, because they are not going to be bonus segments anymore. They're going to be bonus episodes showing up in your feed at the same time as the regular show with their own episode descriptions, so you can see right away what we're talking about. Like, for instance, this week, Joel and I are going to discuss a bunch of fascinating and kind of concerning stories about the rise of sports betting, uh, stories that came out this past week, including one in which the coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers said he's been directly threatened by gamblers. If you want to hear that bonus episode and you don't subscribe to Slate Plus already, there are two ways for you to get the whole hang up and listen experience every week. You can either subscribe right now by going to Apple Podcasts and clicking try free at the top of our show page, or you can visit slate.com slash hangup plus to get access wherever you listen, get bonus episodes on this show, listen ad free and get all of the good Slate Plus accoutrement that we're always talking about. So Apple Podcasts, click try free or go to slate.com slash hangup plus. It is over. The Houston Cougars 
survive and advance in a March Madness thriller here in Memphis. When the Houston Cougars held off Texas A&M for 195 overtime win late Sunday night, it meant that all four number one seeds of the NCAA men's tournament made it through the first weekend. And so did all the number two seeds. That's the first time that's happened since 2019, and only the fourth since the field expanded to 64 teams in 1985. That chalk held through much of the rest of the tournament. Of the 16 remaining teams, 12 were seeded on the top four lines. Another two, Gonzaga and San Diego State, are five seeds, and obviously few people are surprised to see them this deep in the tournament. And on the women's side, half of the Sweet 16 will be set late Monday after we finish recording. But most of the heavyweights are still in the running, from Caitlin Clark in Iowa to defending national champion LSU, which is facing its own off-court drama featuring head coach Kim Mulkey that we'll talk about a little later. But Josh, both brackets have pretty much gone to form through the first weekend. And what caught your attention in the first couple rounds? Well, last year when Connecticut, San Diego State, Miami, Florida Atlantic all made the final four in the men's tournament, that was a four seed, two five seeds, and a nine seed. The story was, oh, and uh, transfer portal, NIL, March Madness is even crazier, all the player movement. Uh, well, this year, now that the trend is reversed, I think we can say with confidence that the transfer portal and NIL are just entrenching the sports blue bloods. They're destroying the parody that makes the tournament great. No, uh, what I think we could say is that it's just the tournament. It's the nature of the tournament. It's designed to engineer unusual outcomes, no matter what the kind of superstructure of the sport is. Um, Oakland beating Kentucky, Yale beating Auburn, and all the number one and number two seeds advancing in the Sweet 16. That is also, by definition, unusual, because like you said in your intro, Joel, it very, very rarely happens. This is why I don't fill out a bracket. This is why I don't make predictions, except for the one I made on last week's Mm -hmm. show, that McNeese State would beat Gonzaga. Now I'm like Mm. fully retired from the prediction game forever. Nine straight uh, Sweet 16s for Gonzaga. But I will say, Ben, the one thing I said on the show last week that is like asymptotically approaching smart is that this tournament could bring a reckoning for John Calipari. Like one of the big surprises was Kentucky and its like the latest iteration of its like extremely entertaining and star laden freshman team lost to Oakland, Michigan, 80 to 76 in the first round. But I think, you know, even though there have been years recently where Kentucky missed the tournament, Kentucky lost uh, to St. Peter's in the first round of the tournament. It just seems like this year, because of the buildup and the accumulation of these talented teams not winning for years and years now, there is more talk of like, actually, are we going to pay the $33 million buyout? Actually, does the Calipari getting the most talented recruiting classes, does that just not work in this new era of of college basketball? Um, What do you make of all that, Ben? Yeah. yeah. So I think that that's part of a big part of what has made the tournament this year uh, particularly compelling. I think there's a few things that you want in a good March Madness. One of them is established teams, well-known coaches, Blue Bloods doing well, giving you some narrative continuity, some way to understand the context of what's happening. Another thing is Cinderella's uh, players like Oakland's Jack Golke making 10 three-pointers. A g- guy who is uh, seems to be about 37 years old and has apparently uh, been in college for most of his life, coming out of nowhere to become a star. And then the third thing you want is Blue Bloods failing. You want Blue Blood coaches falling on their face, uh, giving us all some schadenfreude to enjoy. And I think so that's what, what made Calipari's loss to Oakland uh, so compelling. And I think that the thing about this year's Kentucky team is it was both an accumulation, like you said, of the last couple years of losses, but also just like the level of talent on this team as we emerged from the kind of weird COVID years of college basketball. Like these guys had become, at least in my neck of the basketball watching and consuming woods, like these were pretty well known names. Uh, you have Reed Shepard. Uh, you had Rob Dillingham, you had DJ Wagner, like these were names that had like started to become known to basketball fans. And so I think the expectations, even though they were a three seed and obviously were not a juggernaut, I think that the anticipation of what they were going to do was higher. And then, of course, they kind of went out and played like the perfect game to give everyone fodder for opinions that, you know, not only were they upset, but they were upset by like this guy who does not look like, you know, who, who you know, Jack Golke looks like the proverbial guy who's going pro in something other than sports, I guess is the way to put it. So it all kind of all came together 
um, for Calipari to be, to be on the hot seat there. You know, it says something about the state of the game that this Kentucky team with the Rob Dillinghams, the Reed Shepherds, the DJ Wagners is considered so talented. And I think about the actual most talented Kentucky basketball team that I ever saw, which had John Wall, Boogie Cousins, Eric Bledsoe. Uh, and that team fell short of the, I don't even think they made it to this Final Four. They lost in the Elite Eight to West Virginia. And so, like, I'm, people have talked so much about the talent all over this year's Kentucky's roster team, and I'm looking at them, and I'm like, what are they talking about? <laughs> like, obviously, they're, they're, they're really good college basketball players, but it's, it says something to me about, like, the high-end talent that is available and is playing in college now as opposed to what was playing maybe, you know, a decade ago or so. And so I, I think that, like, so when people focus so much on John Calipari and how much talent he's bringing in. I don't think they're looking at it and saying, well, you know what? This is a lot of talent, but relative to everybody else in the tournament, it's not that much talented. Like, I didn't see anybody out there that could impose their will, like a John Wall or Anthony Davis, you know, or, or something like that. And so, um, you know, it could just be that Calipari is a victim of the times, that this model for team building isn't quite what it used to be. And he needs to pivot to something else. But the thing that that is sort of crazy to me, but and I can be moved off of it because I've seen enough charts saying John Calipari hasn't done well compared to all the other you know Kentucky coaches that preceded him. Like if you you know go over like the last four to five years, it's clear that Calipari has not done well, not even by the standards of his predecessors. But I'm always kind of a guy that's like, you know, man, winning is hard. <laughs> And um, if you can win at a high level and kind of give yourself enough talent every year to be in the mix, especially going into a single elimination tournament, then like maybe you should just keep trying. So what, in one way, that strategy helped me out. And BML knows what I'm going to say because I'm like, <laughs> Michigan, don't fire Jim Harbaugh. I'm saying that around 2020 because that guy's a good coach. You're winning. Don't take it for granted. But then I was thinking about this, Josh, and he's like, you know, where else? You know who else I said shouldn't fire their winning coach? and aspired to more, I said, man, why would Georgia fire Mark Richt? Like, who is Georgia? Like, why would you ever think you could do better than that? And so, like, I was like, ah. So I could see Kentucky sort of, you know, Kentucky fans getting tired of this and being like, wait a minute. Actually, we do think we're better than this, and we can do more than this. Yeah, I mean, there's a perception issue with Kentucky and with that fan base that I think kind of does dovetail with reality, which is that, we're Kentucky. <laughs> I mean, Kansas, Duke, North Carolina have all done consistently better than Kentucky in this last run of years. And those are the programs that I think legitimately Kentucky considers its peers. Now, UCLA missed the tournament this year. You can't say UConn because UConn, before Dan Hurley got there, was missing the tournament too. Like UConn had this period where, oh, they fired their coach and they got a new one and now they're great again. Um, so that's, you know, a potential <laughs> argument for Kentucky to, to do something. And then you have programs like Indiana, where remember Indiana? Um, I mean, that the, Indiana used to be Indiana or Louisville, who we were kind of joking about in the intro. There are a bunch of different <laughs> pathways here. And then, you know, as as alluded to, you have Gonzaga and you have the University of Houston, nine straight Sweet 16s and five straight Sweet 16s. It is possible in this era of college basketball to have consistent results. And you know what else probably rankles, Joel? Alabama has mm. now made two, sw two straight Sweet yeah. 16s. Right. Well, you know what, Josh? I realized somebody told me that Kentucky hasn't even won an SEC tournament game in four years. I like that was shocking to me. I was like, oh, it's not just that they're bad in the NCAA tournament, like they're bad in their own tournament that they should own, right? Yeah, I think that gets at what maybe might be, you know, one of the differences between the Calipari uh, situation and something like, like Jim Harbaugh. Because to me, you got to look at what expectations you're setting, right? And you've alluded to it somewhat by talking about. Kentucky's self-conception as being a blue blood of college basketball. The other part of it is, you know, John Calipari gets paid something like $9 million a year. He gets paid m way more than any other college coach. Um, and, you know, he comes in and, and his system is supposed to, supposed to win championships. And if not win championships, I think 
at least produce brilliant basketball, like of the kind you're talking about. Like I, I think it would be, would have been unfair to be upset that that team with Boogie Cousins, uh, and John Wall lost in the Elite Eight. Like that to me is bad luck in a, in a single elimination tournament. But when you look at what the teams have been doing lately and what the team is doing this year, like this was a team that was not even in the top 100 on defense, you know, in college basketball, which has been something, you know, Calipari's teams have been good at, you know. So he's not even necessarily delivering on what he promised and getting a little unlucky. Like he's fallen behind even the the expectation that he has set. Like, and the the conference tournament thing gets at it a little too. Like, yeah, if you're, if your fans are saying we want to be in the final four every year, that's ridiculous. No program can, can aspire to that. But like, when they're paying, you know, whatever, you know, collectively paying, you know, what they're paying to support Calipari and the cost of the program, and it's the premier program at that school, and you're not getting that reward and, and that juice out of the, the big tournament games, but you're not getting it at a conference tournament, you're not really getting, like, big matchups in the regular season, at that point, you kind of have to start asking, like, well, well, what are we paying for? And also, just as you mentioned that, uh, BML, do you know who else I was just thinking about who's good, who also has to piss Kentucky fans off? Tennessee, like Tennessee's right there. They're in the Sweet 16 now, too. I mean, they're, they're a good, I mean, so it's not like Kentucky is falling behind everybody, even relative to its peers, right, Josh? And, and Kentucky had Oscar Shibwe, Player of the Year, who is an older player. They have had, um, 2022 team had an older roster. That didn't work either. I think when you lose to St. Peter's and to Oakland and the NCAA tournament, there's like, March Madness is like a random number generator, but like, that should that shouldn't happen to a Kentucky <laughs> roster, and you know, Joel, it's easy for you to say um, John Wall and and some of those other guys. Rob Dillingham could be a multi-time All Star. Reed Shepard could be a multi-time All Star. We don't know. Like, I, I think Michael Kidd Gilchrist was a huge flop in the NBA. It was like the number two overall pick and was one of the key players on that Anthony Davis team that won the national title. And so these these things can go a lot of different ways, but. To kind of transition out of this and back to Oakland, the the Jack Golke phenomenon is really uh, funny and I think telling to me. I mean, this guy gets like a TurboTax endorsement, like I'm seeing on, as like a video on my Instagram within like 24 hours of the game. Uh, I think it was like the Men in Blazers guy who was saying he is like the baldest person with hair that he had ever seen in his life. (laughs) But I think he is the perfect example, Ben, of what I think is like maybe a kind of like secret reason why March Madness is so popular, that is that it's in a lot of ways, in a lot of games and with a lot of these teams, white guy wish fulfillment. Like this guy was the number one white guy wish fulfillment player in the history of the NCAA tournament. I can say that with confidence without actually thinking about it because, you know, it's just, just, well, what else do I need to say? Just look at the guy. <laughs> well, you know, I don't want to sell him too short. Like he, he was pretty fast. Like he was getting around screens. <laughs> White people on those can Kentucky- be fast, Ben. <laughs> okay, sure. That's a fair point. Um, you know, I think like he had a style of play that was this conducive to like, hey, go turn the channel. This guy is shooting every time he gets the ball. And then like and then you had like the kind of like follow up wave as it went around the country through group chats that like he had only taken eight two pointers <laughs> all season. So like this guy was I, I'm not sure we will ever get a more March Madness guy than this guy, um, like given how old he is, what he looks like and how he plays. Is that something that goes through you guys minds when you see the like extremely white sports writing core that covers the tournament say things like this guy is what March Madness is is all about or or Yale is what March Madness is all about. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good good yeah, alley I mean, pass for I, you there, Joel. I mean the 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 uh I mean the racial dynamics of the people covering, the people watching and the people playing is always there, even if it goes unremarked upon right and so you know that that guy Goki like he represents something to people by like you know knocking off these entitled overpaid athletes who are cashing in on NIL and they're not even worth it yet they haven't done anything yet but I think even with if you don't have that attitude there is still something either conscious or subconscious 
about seeing, you know, representation is important, Joel. You know, seeing yourself on the screen. <laughs> See, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, nobody's ever seen anybody look like Jack Goldkin, I'm sure. Well, probably not since, like, you know, the 1950s St. Louis Hawks or something. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think it's, I get why people are drawn to a guy like that. Like, he obviously does have a great story, and obviously he had a great performance in a tight, and you know, at the biggest moment of his life. I get why he became a star, but yes, I, I understand why people might look at him and say, that's the kind of guy, that's what college basketball, that's what college sports is all about, that guy right Joel, there. Joel, do you know who's a visiting uh, faculty and fellow at the uh, at, I do. At Jack Golke's alma mater, Hillsdale College? I do, I do. Man, it's it's like looking at uh, a Regnery Publishing <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> weekend retreat. But yes, it's Clarence Thomas who's one of the visiting faculty <laughs> fellows there. I, I wonder if you think somebody should ask Jack if he if he's met Clarence. Do you think Clarence is rooting for Jack Golke in that game? Oh my God. Do you think there's any way that Clarence roots for Kentucky and, you know, John Calipari? I could see that really rubbing him the wrong way. That whole thing. I'll push back against that a little. Like, have we really seen that much this guy plays the right way uh, narrative around Jack Golke? Like, I, I wonder if we have. He, should, and he just pitch- jacks up three-pointers every time. I was going to say he doesn't play the right way. So, like, I, <laughs> you know, like, those are extremely ill-advised bad shots. Like, that's not Bobby Knight basketball. Uh, so that's, like, one part of it. But then the other part of it is, like, you know, I do think uh, the, the dynamics that you're talking about notwithstanding, like, we have had um, Cinderella's in recent years that do not fit that kind totally, of like yeah. aging aging sports writer uh sanctimonious profile you know like uh florida gulf coast a couple of years ago uh maybe florida atlantic last year i'm looking at like north carolina state this year who i know you wanted to talk about so i don't think it's necessarily always just that that archetype making march madness exciting i think there's a lot of reasons why march madness is popular and this is only one of of many but i think it's a, it is a part of the opening round which people often say is like the best day in sports that's Thursday Friday games where you see these kind of these kind of mismatches and sometimes there's a player who like really goes off sometimes it's a white player sometimes it's a, a black player uh, yeah but okay well what actually this is just real quick what can we name a black player from the last half decade i mean cuz obviously NIL is just its own thing right but has there ever been any black player that played really well in the first cut. This is I'm pu- I'm putting everybody on tough. This is really difficult in the first couple rounds. That has become this sort of a breakthrough national sensation. Not a coach, a player that is cashed in and become elevated in quite this way. I can't think of one, but that may just be because I mean, off the top of my head, this is kind of cheating. But uh, you know, Steph Curry at Davidson was <laughs> one of those guys. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> what else? But yeah, I mean, often like when it's a Norfolk State or somebody winning it's it's more often it's a it's a team like you're celebrating the the team yeah. rather than an individual like this yeah I mean, it'll be interesting to see if we get a guy like this a, a, a black player that has this sort of performance and see what sort of nil deals are available to him in the aftermath but i can't i have you know if somebody is listening to this and can show me some you know give me a name Harold the show arsenal that example. was that's a way back in the day for Weber State being North Carolina, but you know there was no uh, NIL for him back then. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll like this is kind of cheating just because I've been following these guys because of the Mitch coaching surf, but like like John L. Davis at FAU, like I don't know if these or, or Marquez Snow uh, at K- Kansas State who has had like that similar kind yeah. of like deep three game. But I think your point, I think your point is taken because it took me, it did take me a second to to come up with those guys, and I think they also both of them had like much stronger resumes going in than than Golki. Like they were not full cares in the same way. Like they were already like pretty good established basketball players. We'll talk about Kim Elke versus the Washington Post in the next segment. We'll try not to get sued. Wings for the game? Boom. Cash back. New lucky jersey? Boom. Cash back. Even a last-minute ice run can score you some cash back when you use your debit card. That's right, all with your debit card. With Discover Cashback Debit, everyone can earn cash back on everyday purchases. Look, in sports, it's hard to predict who's getting the win. But you know what's going to guarantee a win? Discover Cashback Debit. There are no fees, period. It's a real game-changer. Check out transaction eligibility and terms at discover.com slash cashbackdebit. Discover Bank. Member FDIC. 
This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. AI is moving so fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Welcome to Dear Artie, an advice column from SAP, where we tackle the tricky questions at the intersection of AI and business. Here's our expert, the technology futurist, Ian Kahn. Hi, I'm excited to dive into today's question. Dear Artie, as our company expands, so do our hiring efforts. How can AI help us attract top talent? Signed, Searching for Higher Power. So, Searching for Higher Power, one of the most daunting undertakings of an HR leader today is building a new team and finding and vetting new talent. This is a very time-consuming process and can take precious organizational resources. As a companion to the HR team, AI technology can be used to create job descriptions, analyze candidate resumes, and filter candidates into various pools based on experience, skills, or any other parameter. You can also use AI to match internal talent with positions available. Parameters for this can be set, rules can be set, that can all be done through the algorithm. There are so many things that we as humans could be not looking at that AI can do in a matter of seconds. Embrace AI with confidence. Head to sap.com slash AI to learn more. The day before LSU's dominant second round win over Middle Tennessee State, head coach Kim Mulkey did some amazing pre-publication publicity for the Washington Post by launching a preemptive strike against the outlet and the reporter who's been working on a lengthy profile about her and her coaching career. Here's some of her remarks to the media on Saturday. I'm fed up. And I'm not going to let the Washington Post attack this university, this awesome team of young women I have, or me without a fight. I've hired the best defamation law firm in the country, and I will sue the Washington Post if they publish a false story about me. Not many people are in a position to hold these kind of journalists accountable, but I am, and I'll do it. Now we pivot to Josh, Big LSU super fan, likely contributor to the NIL fund for uh, Kim Mulkey. But look, as we record Monday morning, Kent Babb's story still hasn't been released, and we can only speculate as to what he'll cover in there. But I think uh, coaches handle all this so far. America's foremost newspaper salesperson. Just bringing, <laughs> bringing the media back one press conference at a time. Um, while I am not an NIL contributor, I am the world's leading expert on Kim Mulkey press conferences. I think listeners of the show can attest. And this was truly uh, a command performance by her. Um, you know, I think perhaps unintentionally, she also like wrote the defense brief for the Washington Post in a potential defamation suit by talking at length about how how long the reporter has been working on the story, two years, <laughs> and how he's attempted to contact her to get her to comment for all that time. She made a bunch of allegations that I don't think we should actually air um, about what's in the story and like claims about what the reporter did, kind of unethical tactics that I think we have no particular reason to believe and we should see the story before we come to any conclusions. But Ben, um, you did reporting in uh, Baton Rouge for your, for your book. You've reported around LSU. And the thing that was fascinating to me is that she cited a piece that Kent Babb, the journalist, wrote for The Washington Post, which she called a hit piece on Brian Kelly, which if you actually, well, and just to make your, to make your point, Joel, um, that piece went to number one most read in the entire Washington Post after the press conference. <laughs> but if you look at that piece, it is an incredibly thoroughly reported story about how an LSU being just one example of this, when a coach makes a huge salary like Brian Kelly or Kim Mulkey, there are a bunch of employees at the school who are making relative peanuts, kind of living in you know poverty conditions while the football team what in the athletic department are kind of basking in, in luxury. And Ben, you know, this is something that I think you saw and how it kind of plays out at, at LSU in particular. Yeah, I think there was a bunch of things interesting about about her statement. One of them being that she, she kind of uh, implied that journalists and journalism journalists are the most 
powerful profession in the country uh, right now, which I, I wish were too. And I, and I don't think, I don't think it is. Yeah. I, so the example, uh, when I was on campus three or four years ago was that the, um, central student library had a hole in the roof and someone had told me this and I kind of thought they were joking, like making like a, a kind of like a, you know, an attempt at dark humor, but like what could be the most obvious problem that a uh, institution that spent a lot of on sports could have with its academics. But it turned out to be true. There was actually just a hole in the roof of the library and they had like tarps and buckets set up in there for an extended period. Cause like they couldn't get the hole fixed because there wasn't money for it. So yeah, I think, I think it does, uh, it speaks to that. It speaks to that issue. The fact that Mulkey, you know, and Brian Kelly are, you know, the two most high profile people associated with LSU. They're both well compensated. They're the ones that get the attention. I thought what, one thing that was just interesting to me was that actually LSU was a very friendly athletic department, certainly compared to the University of Michigan and was like very open to me doing reporting about them, even though I was pretty upfront that I was going to, you know, to ask them questions about, you know, asking a donor or questions about like how much money he has to give to be close to the football team, stuff like that. So I thought it was kind of surprising that, that this, this hostility has emerged. I mean, honestly, what I expect from this story is I, I kind of expect it to be balanced. I, I don't really expect a hit job in the Washington Post. That's not really what they do. And I would actually kind of expect that there probably will be a lot in this story about like the benefit, you know, the, the impact that Mulkey has had on uh, her players and on her institutions you know, t- toward the positive end of the spectrum, as well as I'm sure there will be unflattering anecdotes about her. Um, but I'm curious about that, Josh, like to, to what extent do you think having been a follower of the program and of her as a coach, like if this piece does come out and, and alleges that she's, a, you know, abusive or, or you know, is, is out of control and that the way, way too much is, uh, you know, made too much attention and resources are lavished on her. Like, I, I mean, how do you how do you perceive that as an LSU fan? Like, do you think those accusations have merit? Well, I don't want to comment on (laughs) imaginary allegations that we haven't uh, seen yet. Although I will say that if now it's funny, the ways that LSU, I think in in a way LSU is totally incidental to the story. She's bigger than the university. These uh, her career extends beyond the university. Her most famous, the most famous kind of negative stuff about her is about her relationship with Brittany Griner at uh, Baylor and, you know, that extended into an LSU tenure as um, Kim Mulkey um, very publicly kind of refused to say more than the bare minimum about Brittany Griner's detention in uh, Russia. But, you know, this stuff, this stuff meaning what she did at the press conference, you can kind of read it one of two ways. Number one, a sports information department, any PR department at any institution what I think advise you not to do what she did, calling attention to something that she perceives is going to be negative um, before it exists. And that people, you know, way more people are going to read now and are just like anxiously refreshing on the Washington Post website to see what they could possibly have, because it seems like it's going to be pretty fascinating. On the other hand, Joel, um, calling out the media, saying the journalists are hacks, threatening defamation suits is an extraordinarily popular position to hold, I think, in America, but in Louisiana specifically. Um, And this is what she did is going to make her more popular among the people in her community. I don't know about the people in the athletics department, whether it'll make her you know, a cause celeb before the story even comes out. And so it was dumb on the one hand, but it might actually, in some ways, make her more popular and more bulletproof in the state. Well, I was actually wondering about that. I was like, well, there's no way that she could unilaterally decide to call a press conference like that without permission from some sort of institutional backing. I wasn't, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. It doesn't seem like the women's basketball coach would have the sort of latitude that Brian Kelly would have, for instance, right, I under these circumstances. Yeah. But I don't know. But that's the thing. I don't know. And so, but but to your point, I think that if there is an administration, if there, and there's been a, a changing of the guard at LSU here in the last few months, I'd call attention. I, I wrote a, 
a story uh, a few months ago after the election of Louisiana's new governor, Jeff Landry. He's a far right wing former attorney general. And um, one of the professors I spoke to there, Robert Mann, he he resigned uh, it, after that election because of the fear of the, the, the oncoming administration, right? That they were going to, you know, they're going to be a lot more punitive, a lot more uh, negative towards public scrutiny or that sort of thing. So I'm just wondering, I was like, you know what? She might have a lot of institutional cover here. And so even though it didn't seem smart um, and we're just like, wow, she's driving up, you know, the publicity and the tension for the story that hasn't even dropped yet. I just wonder if it was a way of rallying the troops in a way that sort of insulates her from criticism or the sort of pushback that you might get somewhere else. Because I would say that, like, right now, Coach Mulkey would probably in this particular instance, have the sort of institutional backing and support to launch that sort of counterattack against the media and get support no matter what is reported there. And I think, you know, BML, you actually made a really good point that her being hysterical in this way sets the bar pretty high for the sort of allegations that are going to be made against her. And it almost certainly won't reach that level, right? Like, it, like nothing that's going to be reported is going to merit the sort of response that she made on Saturday, I don't think. Yeah, and I guess what I was kind of trying to get at, you you articulated well, which is clearly that, you know, unless this, what comes out is something that's, you know, completely like beyond what anyone could imagine, basically what we know, what we know already is that LSU has a very brash women's basketball coach who is controversial, who annoys coastal elites, and clearly LSU already knows that and already likes it. So I guess that's what I was trying to get at. And she won a at. national championship, by the way. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I was kind of trying to, to, to frame it like that and say, like, obviously there are people, whether or not it's Josh, particularly as a fan of LSU sports, there are definitely people who are fans of LSU sports and who are in that administration and around the school who already like everything she's delivering from the venue of a women's basketball program, which I think is kind of like probably unprecedented, you know, for certainly right now, the LSU women's program is much more of a kind of like PR leader for the university than its men's program. Maybe not as much as the football team, but certainly on that level. And so I think that's kind of what's fascinating about it for me as an observer of college sports is the way that this personality in the sport has come, suddenly come to be seen as such an important expression of the university's character and its personality, uh, you know, and it's... Um, you know, kind of like you're getting at kind of like maga almost. almost, uh, you know, that's something we've never seen before in this in this sport. And even and even prior to this, you know, I'll, I'll just leave my own experience with the LSU uh, SID is that, I, you know, my first assignment at ESPN in 2017 was to do a profile on the former LSU running back Darius Geis. And I met with him after the, on the field of the Superdome after the BYU, everything was all set up. And then he just disappeared on me for three days. And as it turned out, uh, <laughs> you can look, you can Google his name. Um, he faced some pretty serious sexual assault allegations that ca that emerged later. Like, you know, at, even after he'd been um, drafted into the NFL, but it was even at that time, LSU was sort of moving pieces around the behind because people were asking questions about what was going on in the program. So this SID department is experienced. It's sort of, you know, keeping people away from asking the questions and keeping people away from people at the center of, you know, controversies or whatever. So it's just, I don't know if this is the smart thing to do, if they're doing the right thing, but for whatever, you know, their fan base and the people that support them, it seems like this is how they want them to operate, no matter what is going to be reported in the Washington Post. LSU um, won on Sunday. Iowa is playing with Caitlin Clark on Monday night. Um, as is uh, UCLA and Joel's favorite program, Creighton. Um, LSU is going to play the UCLA Creighton winner and would still be set up to play Iowa in a national championship game rematch, which I believe would be a Monday game a week from today, if if that were to happen. Just would be the biggest game, <laughs> I think, that you know could potentially be played hypothetically in either tournament this year and just the hype around that game, kind of what Mulkey has been saying and doing off the court could all potentially build for the next week. Like this is the time when the most 
possible attention is going to be paid to this program, this team, and these players. And LSU, you know, they're a number three seed. They wouldn't be favored against UCLA. And so it's unclear whether that game would actually happen. But it was interesting to me that the players on the team who are famous in their own rights, Angel Reese, Mm -hmm. who uh, mysteriously didn't play for part of earlier this year, and Flage Johnson were supportive of Mulkey over the weekend. Um, and there is this kind of history, this divide mm-hmm. among her former players of, you know, when the stuff about Brittany Griner came out in the past about Mulkey not necessarily supporting her um, when she was gay at Baylor, play, other players came out and said, Kim Mulkey is great. We love her. We can't believe that negative things are being said about her. And so her current team in this moment is kind of being put in a position to potentially defend her or comment on her. They're definitely not going to come out and say, we hate her in this moment. But it's just an interesting spot that these women are being put in. A friend of mine, uh, and shout out, Decker, the second week you made the show, I was hoping that the LSU administration, we were saying we're hoping the LSU administration have fully informed the players and the former players what's going to be in that story so they don't look crazy if something comes out. You know what I mean? Like if it's something that's really egregious and they're like, oh, we've been supporting this person publicly, you know, out front for Coach Mulkey and it's something that's really, really bad. So um, I hope that they're doing those players at least that courtesy if they're going to step out there and put their credibility on the line to support this coach. I want to add something to what you said, Joel. And I want to, something that I think is a difference between LSU and, and other institutions you talked about the the Darius Geis profile that you had been set up to do, and then he kind of disappeared, and it turned out there was some serious allegations against him. What I think is interesting about that story is I'm not sure you would have been in that position even to begin with at another school with a star running back who who maybe I would imagine they already probably had some inkling that you know he, he was not a choir boy in his personal habits. I, I, you know, just a guess, and I don't think you would have been at that position at all at maybe Alabama, uh, you know, and other institutions like that. So to some extent, to tie it together, like, I think that LSU might not like every single thing about this situation or how Mulkley has handled it or what's going to be alleged in the post. But to some extent, they like being in this position. Like, the LSU likes being in the spotlight. And that means bringing in people like Ken Mulkey. Uh, and to some extent, like, you know, this is where they want to be. <laughs> Up next, Shohei Otani and the mystery of what the hell is going on with Shohei Otani. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting, all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try, and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want, like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate and their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and ready to compare so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the more than 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase, every day. That's 3% on your favorite products at Apple, 2% on all other Apple Card with Apple Pay purchases, and 1% on anything you buy with your titanium Apple Card or virtual card number. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City Branch, subject to credit approval. Terms apply. On Friday afternoon, Major League Baseball announced that after, quote, gathering information, it was launching an investigation into the allegations involving Shohei Otani and his interpreter, Ipe Mizahara. To which I say, you and me both, buddy. And what my investigation has turned up so far is that the story is very confusing. 
Early last week, a crisis communications firm representing Otani told ESPN that the L.A. Dodgers star had spent $4.5 million to pay off his interpreter's gambling debts. That PR firm then arranged an interview with ESPN in which Mizuhara, the interpreter, said the same thing. Then, less than 24 hours later, the crisis communications person came back to ESPN with an on-the-record statement. In the course of responding to recent media inquiries, we discovered that Shohei has been the victim of a massive theft, and we are turning the matter over to the authorities. The interpreter then said that yes, actually, he had been lying the whole time, and he was ready to face all the consequences. Ben, Otani is going to speak to the media for the first time today, Monday, after we record this episode. Kind of a recurring theme for this episode. Um, (laughs) But what do you make of this story and how it's all spooled out so far? So I think a a couple of things. One is, obviously, this is a very wild story. And for those who have not read into the details completely, the current um, narrative being put forward by, let's call it Otani's camp, the crisis communications manager, uh, Otani himself, so far as we are able to understand what he's uh, saying, because he's speaking through representatives so far, is that Otani's former interpreter had told everybody else that Otani knew about these payments to uh, an illegal bookmaker, but was not telling Otani that because he was his interpreter. And that Otani only learned about this during a team meeting in which another interpreter was present and conveyed to him that the story was that he knew about the payment. There is kind of like sitcom like plot aspects to this where the interpreter (laughs) is like missing, like, telling Otani the wrong that is like lying about what's happening because Otani needs an interpreter and trust this guy and is just and this guy is just like lying about what's being said. Right. And so, I mean, I, at first, I thought that seemed kind of implausible, as you suggest, because it does kind of seems like something that would be out of the plot of a, of a farce. But then when you read a little bit more about their relationship, it becomes a little more plausible and a little more sad because this is someone who's known Otani for, for 10 years, uh, by all accounts. They were close personal friends, and this is someone who he would trust. I think that was something that, that maybe a lot of people, myself included, said initially. It was like, is it really plausible that a multi, multi, multi millionaire athlete would trust his interpreter with enough information to be able to send a wire transfer for $500,000? And what's kind of come out is that, like, yeah, maybe, maybe he would. Nate Silver has written that the wealthy gamblers he knows, some of them he could see doing that, letting someone else control their bank information. Uh, and then we do know that, that these guys, um, appeared to have a very close relationship. So you could see him not really, you could see Otani not being willing to believe that this guy would lie to him. Well, Ben, you said that Nate Silver was talking about wealthy gamblers. It's unclear. And from what we know, from what Otani claims, he is not a gambler. I mean, it feels a little bit on the nose, some of this stuff. It's like, I hate gambling. I, and then <laughs> with with all these allegations, Dole, it's like, no, there was no betting on baseball done here. It like, on the one hand, the story is kind of wild. Like the initial story that Otani knew about it and was then changed by lawyers to, oh, Otani didn't know about it. That's like obviously going to raise a whole set of questions. And then the fact that the story is there was no betting on baseball and Otani wasn't involved. It's like, because if there was betting on baseball and Otani was involved, he could potentially get banned for life from Major League Baseball. And so that seems convenient as well. Yeah. And I guess the thing is, is that it all seems... I guess the the overwhelming sense I get from this is sadness for Otani in a way, because, I mean, there's a lot of ways that this story could go. Um, you know, we we could, your, your worst assumptions about what Otani's involvement is here or your most generous interpretations of what is going on here. But um, it all sort of seems plausible. And I just, I you know, you don't know... Like, it could be that the interpreter has just run a a long con on all of us, right? Like, starting from Otani to ESPN to, you know, Otani's, you know, the rest of Otani's team. There's been reporting that he lied on his resume or or lied about where he went to school and who he had interpreted for in the past. Yeah, there's enough information here that makes you think that, okay, like, this guy might not be on the level. And so that it's, it's, it's possible that that Otani was really exposed here or that he is being 
a homeboy Hall of Fame, you know, candidate forever. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> On the level of Greg Anderson and Barry Bonds or something like that, where he's just like, well, I'm going to take the, you know, I'll take these charges for you, right? It could be any of that. But I guess one thing about it is that, and I don't know if you all were surprised by this at all, and I, I, I feel embarrassed because I literally wrote a column on the growth of sports gaming. And it was in the course of reading this story that I I realized I didn't know that it was illegal to gamble in California. Now, did you? Did you? One all, of the few. I did didn't you, know that. One of the few states yeah, I mean, where it's still illegal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I kind of, I didn't realize that. I did not know that. And that ties into something that I was thinking about this story, which is, and maybe, maybe you can convince me I'm, I'm wrong on this. But when you hear a story <laughs> involving gambling on sports and Major League Baseball, your first tendency, my first tendency as a journalist uh, is to think, wow, this really implicates Major League Baseball and the professional gambling industry, you know, DraftKings, FanDuel, um, and so forth. I, weirdly, this story has evolved in a way where I don't think it does. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you c- certainly can still raise many questions about about whether we should have gambling apps on our phone and whether the sports league should be in business with them. But I, And I think the the way that a lot of people initially reacted was to say, well, of course this is going to happen when you have these, these things around athletes, but like maybe it doesn't. Like I actually think Major League Baseball kind of handled this appropriately. And as far as we can tell, like none of it has anything to do with, you know, their, whatever their relationships are with the gambling companies. I mean, Joel and I are going to talk about the larger gambling story in the bonus segment because there have been a bunch of things that have come up in the past week, um, that are more directly about the leagues and their relationships with these gambling companies. But, you know, Ben, I I think in some sense it doesn't matter because this is about the most famous baseball player and it is about gambling at a time when every sports league is developing these cozier relationships um, with the gambling companies. And so if you want to, like, parse it in such a way that, like, this actually doesn't say anything about the larger FanDuel and DraftKings of it all. You can maybe make that argument. But I think in terms of how this is going to drive coverage, in terms of like what <laughs> reporters and editors are going to be looking into, I think it's all going to it's going to drive more coverage of these relationships. Um, but I also think that, you know, it, it's just too early for us to actually say what the implications of the story are, what they will be. But my last kind of comment on this is, you know, so much talk to all about why aren't, why isn't Otani more famous? Why isn't Mike, Mike Trout more famous? Like baseball, nobody knows who these baseball players are. Everybody says the most famous baseball player is Derek Jeter and he doesn't even play anymore. Shohei Otani, congratulations on figuring out a way <laughs> to become more famous. Not just being the greatest baseball player anyone has ever seen, doing things that no one's ever seen before. You have now become pop culturally known in a way you weren't before. Well, it's kind of crazy, right? Because like, I mean, I think most casual baseball fans or people that it, or even only have a passing interest in baseball know maybe the names Babe Ruth, maybe they know <laughs> Derek Jeter. Casual <laughs> baseball all, but, fans. No, well, I'm just saying, but, but they all, but, but do, they, do they know Pete Rose? Like, where do you think Pete Rose ranks in there, in, in, in the top I just think like it's five. funny you're saying casual baseball fans. Like, how casual of a baseball... <laughs> you call yourself a fan, but you're so casual that the only player you know is Babe Ruth. Well, I'd like to meet this person. Saying. Well, I'm just saying. I mean, I mean, obviously you could go Willie Stargell, whatever. You know what I'm saying? If you need to do that. The only Kevin players Bass, I've heard of make are you feel Babe Ruth. Mike Willie Scott, Stargell. Mike Lillard, we're just you know, naming players. Yeah, uh, right. Dave Scott Concepcion, yeah. you know, just uh, those are the three just, players I've randomly heard of. Just name some guys, Craig Biggio. But no, um, but <laughs> but no. I mean, I think the thing is, just like, I mean, it feels like you know somebody reached out to me about the Otani story, and they're like, wow, they're, you know, they work at a publishing house, and they released really this Pete Rose book, and they're like, wow, this Pete Rose book is really a big deal now, isn't it? And I'm like, oh man, if that's the way you get famous, is that's the first time that anybody wants to talk to you about baseball, and it's like, man, then it's kind of sound like Pete Rose. That can't be a good thing. Like no matter, no, like no matter what comes of this, no matter how it's resolved, no matter what the, you know, we find out o- Otani's involvement in this ultimately is. 
that doesn't seem like a good thing. Even though, like as you said, Ben, as the story unfolds, this really doesn't seem to shed much new light or commentary on the growth of sports gambling. Like it seems to be a fairly limited set of circumstances, you know, limited to maybe one, maybe two, three people, right? Yeah, and like the especially like the fact that it sounds like this was uh, actually all done like offline, basically through like a, a Southern California celebrity poker game it's guy, like a you 1980s know, like that, ass story, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, to the extent that. Uh, all these apps and the legalization of gambling is creating more people with gambling problems. I think that's the connection. It could be a literal connection to the story, but that's the connection that people are going to draw that's not going to, it's not going to be kind of wished away or waved away or ex explained away. Yeah, I guess it's like the, maybe this isn't the story, but the next one will be about a star player using a gambling app to gamble his own money. You know, like, I guess that's kind of like, Part of I mean, it the is NFL like sus here. suspending dudes for for gambling. Right. I mean, this has already been a story, just with nobody as as high profile. Ben, um, we're going to let you go now, but um, your book, The Hot Seat, is maybe the only thing we've talked about in the show that is not coming out after we record. <laughs> that we actually know what's in it, so people should uh, go and check out that book. As always, we appreciate you. Thank you, guys. Hot Seat available this very second. custom tailored suit it's going to fit perfectly and make you look great think about that with a noble first for your organization no matter what the size of your company is a noble first will analyze your data and collaborate with you to custom tailor digital solutions so you can focus on making your organization grow when it comes to data centric solutions specifically for your organization choose a noble first a noble first makes living simple See for yourself at anoblefirst.com, E-N-N-O-B-L-E first.com. Now it is time for Afterballs, sponsored by Bennett's Prune Juice, endorsed by Kenny Sailors, who says it was okay. So down in Houston, Texas this weekend at the Victor Lopez Classic on the campus of Rice University was a huge showdown for some of the fastest sprint relay teams in the nation. Coming into this outdoor season, there was a lot of scuttlebutt that some team might finally break the 26-year-old national record in the boys' 400-meter relay. That record was 39.76 seconds, set in 1998 by O.D. Wyatt High School in Fort Worth. And if you keep up with Texas sprinting circles, and why would most of you all? <laughs> I mean, just to be honest, it's just me, right? Um, people know that the members of that relay team, Milton Wesley, Michael Franklin, Monty Clompton, Demario Wesley, they gather every year like the 1972 Miami Dolphins to celebrate their mark and to take a little pleasure in all of the teams that have fallen short. That's amazing. Yeah. Not this past Saturday. Finally, a team broke through. Actually, two of them did. But the team with the new national record is Atascacita High School, which clocked in at 38.92 seconds. We can put a link to their performance in the show notes, but you've never seen a group of teenagers run faster than this. And they were anchored, Josh, by LSU football recruit Jelani Watkins. Duncanville High School, the team that finished second and also surpassed that 1998 record, finished with a time of 39.65 seconds. And that relay team's anchor is Josh, also headed to LSU, a running back recruit by the name of Caden Durham. So, look, the winners of a weekend that fast certainly deserve their own afterball name. So I'm going to go with Atascacita, which gets its name from the old Spanish military outpost, which later turned into a road name, Atascacito. Atascacito was once a major route for American migrants moving to Texas in the 1820s and 1830s, no doubt eager to start up new slave plantations. Uh, Houston later annexed part of the area in the 1960s and then de-annexed them in the 1970s. And it's not quite clear why that happened or why the name slowly evolved to Atascacita, but that's beyond the purview of this segment. So, Josh, what is your Atascacita? Uh, did you run against Atascacita? Atascacita High School did not open until 2006. It's actually, though... Because they were afraid of you while you were in high school. They, they just knew. Do you know who probably would have been zoned to that area back in the day? David Boston. One of one of our one of our more muscular wide receivers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot of... I was just saying, there's been a lot of talent in that area for a, lo a long time, so... <laughs> my, 
Atascacita is um, inspired by a bit of the Dayton, Arizona men's tournament game I was watching on Saturday afternoon. I don't know if you caught that one, Joel, but the Flyers have a guy with a pretty amazing name, that name being Kobe Elvis. (laughs) What? I did not see that. (laughs) Kobe Kobe Elvis. Elvis. He scored 13 points in 29 minutes in Dayton's 78 to 68 loss, and he is indeed named after that Kobe, as the Dayton Daily News' Tom Archdeacon explained in a 2021 piece. Incidentally, not a bad name, Tom Archdeacon. Mm. In that story, Elvis explained that his mother, Joy Elvis, grew up in Guyana and was a huge cricket fan. But after immigrating to Canada, she got really into the NBA. She was a huge Lakers fan, and she always loved Kobe and that afro he had, Kobe Elvis said. So she decided to name me Kobe and made Curtis my middle name. His brothers had names that started with C, or his siblings did. Um, Joy Elvis confirmed that story to the reporter and said that around the same time, her brother named his son Scotty Elvis after Scotty (laughs) Pippen, and that her niece named her son Jordan after some other guy on the Bulls. The funniest thing about this to me uh, Joel is Elvis's relationship with his last name. Honestly, I know what he looks like, but that's it, Elvis said, referring to Elvis. I have no idea of any of his songs or anything like that. My thoughts on this are isn't the world a wonderful place that there's a guy named Kobe <laughs> Elvis roaming around playing high level basketball? But I'm a greedy person, Joel. I would also like there to be a LeBron Beyonce, maybe a Shaquille Shakira. <laughs> a Hakeem mm. Tupac, a Giannis mm. Beatles. Um, <laughs> but I'm also a practical person. And uh, you, Joel, and the rest of you out there can start to um, have the swirl around in your head. Um, I started to wonder, what is a combination of instantly identifiable basketball player first name, like Kobe, an instantly identifiable music icon first name, like Elvis, that is actually likely to exist in the world? Oof. Now, you might differ on your rules for this game, but I feel like using Taylor is cheating because even though Taylor Swift, unquestionably an icon, when I see the last name Taylor, I do not immediately think of her. Like, you know, the football player Jim Taylor. I'm like, oh, like Taylor Swift. She's no no Elvis is what I'm saying. (laughs) Um, You guys can weigh in here, but the first hypothetical name I thought of that I wanted to investigate was Jalen Drake. Ah, And when you Google that name, the first thing that comes up is, from just 12 days ago, Fort Wayne man sentenced to 100 months in prison. So, unlikely to see that Jalen Drake in the NCAA tournament. Uh, Too bad. My my next thought was Jalen Kendrick. And there we are. Old Miss and UNLV in the early 2010s. Played Uh, as recently as 2019 for the London Lightning in Canada. Okay. Okay. I like that. What about DeAndre Swift? Does that count? Because DeAndre Jordan, that's what it would, you know. I mean, I, I don't think that's the same thing. You're right? torturing the game to, you know, mm. beyond beyond the rules. Yeah. As DeAndre Jordan, not really famous. I mean, uh, how many De- how many DeAndres do you know? That's true. DeAndre Swift is yeah. not bad. It's not, I'll give you like a B minus. Um, I will give I will give sure. myself a B minus too. For for those names, okay. <laughs> but then I'm gonna I'm gonna wind up here, and we might need uh, Kevin to give me some some backing here. I had a flash of uh, inspiration. What about Kareem? <laughs> what about oh, Kareem God. Rush? Led the Missouri oh. Tigers to the Elite Eight. Led the Big Twelve in oh. scoring in the early 2000s. Then played for five teams in the NBA. What are his thoughts on the Canadian rock band Rush, featuring the likes of Getty Lee and Neil Peart? The one thing I found was a Pacers Digest message board post from 2007, to which a user with the username B-Ball responded, I thought this thread was about Getty Lee, Alex Lifeson, and Neil Peart. If only, my friend, if only. Uh, But let's end where we started. Kobe Elvis averaged 9.4 points for Dayton this year. It was his fourth year of college ball, uh, the first of which he played at DePaul. I believe he has one more year of eligibility remaining, though. The website nil.store has plenty of Elvis merch available, including a Kobe Elvis Dayton jersey for $109.99. So stock up before next year's tournament. And please, no Elvis is in the building jokes. That's all I ask. A couple of D schools, too. Uh, DePaul, uh, Dayton. You know, I like that. I, I, you know, just the Midwest. Yeah, you know, you know, yeah. Your about your rule very... is that transferring should be free as long as you transfer to a school that has the starts with the same letter as your. Yes, yeah, so it should be alliterative. <laughs> so I think next up, what should he go? Uh, 
you know, is it what Detroit, Detroit, another school Detroit Mercy? Yeah, Detroit Mercy. Yeah, you know, that's not bad. So something like that, you could do that. So yeah, I, I like that though. But yeah, man, that's 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 so funny. Now I'm going to be thinking of all the <laughs> names. You, even th- even though you shit on DeAndre Swift, uh, I, I really said it was a B minus. It's you know, it's okay. it's not it's yeah. not perfect, but um, it was definitely good for off the top of the dome. Uh, listeners, hang up at slate.com if you have other fanciful or or uh, real names that fit the Kobe Elvis pattern. That is all for this episode. But we've also got a bonus episode available for you to listen to right now. In that episode, Joel and I are going to talk about all these sports gambling stories going around and whether they're a sign of uh, something we should be concerned about as sports viewers, consumers, and Americans. To listen, subscribe to Slate Plus on Apple Podcasts by clicking Try Free at the top of our show page or visit slate.com forward slash hangup plus to get access wherever you listen. The episode is available right now. We'll see you there. Our show notes are at slate.com slash hangup, and you can email us at hangup at slate.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Our producer is Kevin Bendis. For Joel Anderson and Ben mathis Lilly. I'm Josh Levine. Remember Zelmo Beatty, and thanks for listening. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.